In this edition of Top Shelf Spotlight, we delve into how technology is shaping the future of the grocery industry. Join Mark Brandau, Chloe Riley, and special guest Sylvain Perrier, President of North America and COO of Mercatus, as they unveil the insights from the 2023 Supermarket Technology Review. Discover the transformative power of strategic investments in grocery technology and how it's revolutionizing the way we shop for groceries. Stay tuned into this webinar to learn how operational efficiency and customer experience are at the forefront of this technological revolution and how targeted investments in technology are key to unlocking success in the grocery sector. Let's explore how grocery technology is delivering streamlined operations and enhancing the customer experience. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar with uh, Supermarket News Intelligence and Mercatus. Uh, Today's presentation is how technology is transforming the grocery industry. Uh, The person who's talking right now, that's me, Mark Brando. I'm the guy in the middle there. Uh, I am a moderator with Supermarket News Intelligence. Uh, I helped design the survey from which all these insights are drawn uh, and was the principal author of the report that we're discussing today. But really, the more important folks that are going to be talking today are our industry experts. Uh, So there's Chloe Riley, executive editor of Supermarket News, and Sylvain Perrier, who's the president and CEO of Mercatus. The way that today is going to go is that we're going to start with a big picture look at uh, the supermarket industry and the investments that they're making in different kinds of technologies, which will lead into a discussion about operational efficiencies. Um, And then the next few seconds will be the inside game and kind of the outside game. So uh, growing sales from within the four walls and uh, trying to grow online sales and things like off-premises channels like uh, curbside and, and delivery. Finally, we'll do a discussion of uh, ways that retailers are collecting data and more importantly, using it. Uh, And then we'll get into the uh, real important part of the show, which is the Ask the Experts uh, section where Chloe will be interviewing Sylvain Perrier. Now to begin, we're gonna start with, again, a big picture look at the industry and the uh, tech investments that they're making uh, right now and ahead of 2024. And luckily, uh, pretty much every uh, every retailer who took our survey, would, and there were more than 100 respondents, uh, did identify technology as an important part of their future plans going forward. Nobody said it was unimportant, uh, and nearly half said it was going to be critical to what their plans were for the coming year. Now, they're also going to be starting from a pretty, uh, I would say, satisfied uh, uh, place with their current tech stack. So all of their technologies uh, taken together and integrating uh, colloquially, we'll call that their tech stack. And most folks are fairly satisfied with it. They're more likely than not. Uh, they're more likely to be satisfied than dissatisfied. And, and I would say the, the majority of folks are at least satisfied with their current technology. Uh, it works, but they are still looking for improvements and looking for investment which is why uh, more than nine in 10 folks are in the market for some kind of new technology or upgrade. Um, Very few people are saying that it's probably not gonna happen in the next 12 months. And the way that it's gonna happen, interestingly, is that most folks are looking to uh, probably grow the number of providers that they work with. There there are a few approaches to technology uh, in an industry like ours. You can uh, kind of consolidate, work with fewer technology partners, look for more of an end-to-end solution. Uh, About a quarter of of folks are targeting that. Um, Another quarter are looking to probably stay put, uh, keep the same number of providers, uh, and still look for some new solutions. Uh, But a bare majority of of retailers are looking to work with new and more partners. Now, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of willingness to invest, which is great. Uh, But, of course, with any sort of major outlay like technology, there are going to be some barriers to investment. Um, And I think that a lot of the reasons would look familiar to us, especially right now, kind of uh, in the last, I would say, six to 12 months, there's been a higher interest rate environment. And so the cost of borrowing uh, is much higher. And so uh, costs and budgets are going to be, you know, kind of a, a hurdle for many to overcome. Three and five respondents to the survey. Uh, but there's also uh, the the questions of integration. Again, 
uh, these tech stacks that people work with, they're very, very complicated. And the more that you uh, bring in new solutions and kind of bolt them onto what you already have, uh, whether or not those systems play well together and share data uh, can be you know, a, a difficult part of implementing. Uh, and so that's also a, a big a, a big issue for many of our retailers. But here's where we're gonna try to really tease out some of the differences between uh, chains and independent retailers, which was kind of the big cleavage here. Um, now, independents, it, it uh, probably shouldn't surprise us, are gonna be more budget conscious than, than some of the chains are. Uh, chain supermarkets are part of larger organizations that might have more resources available to them. Uh, and independents, you know, are, are trying to operate in a very low margin business kind of on their own. So it makes sense that they are going to be uh, a little bit more concerned with cost. And I think that does uh, uh, logically go into the issue of staffing as well. Not enough folks to manage new systems. But if you look at uh, the reality for chain supermarkets as well, they're more, uh, a little bit more concerned than independents are about the lack of integration. So the difficulty of implementing new technology, what that might do to operations, and you know, just sort of how unwieldy that could potentially make their tech stack. Uh, the the rest of these options, uh, chains and independents are pretty well aligned on. Um, very few of them are saying, well, there's no willingness to invest. Um, they're not necessarily overwhelmed at the options, but they have different priorities. And uh, Chloe, if you don't mind, I'd like to bring you in here because you're far closer to this industry than I am. And I'm just sort of wondering what you make of these these splits right now between chains and independents when it comes to what might hold them back. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, Mark, just kind of as you, um, you know, just identified, uh, you know, I don't think it's surprising at all necessarily. Um, you know, you look at chains like Walmart, Kroger, Target, um, and, you know, we're just talking you know, mostly just leaps and bounds ahead in terms of, you know, capital to invest in emerging tech. Um, you know, not only that, but, you know, these larger brands also have the human resources, you know, they have a tech division, potentially multiple roles when we're talking about decision makers, you know, when it comes to prioritizing tech and integration, um, you know, whereas an independent might might not have any one individual responsible for tech. Uh, you know, like who's paying attention to those emerging trends, the opportunities for optimization. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I can see, you know, why these numbers fall the way they do. Yeah. And, and uh, it leads into our next section pretty well, I think. Uh, a big priority uh, across the industry, and this, this held for both chains and independents, I think, is uh, when we presented these different priorities for technology, um, ask them to rank, you know, of these five, what do you have number one, all the way to what's number five. Uh, operation of, operational efficiency really rose to the top um, across all kinds of retailers. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, in order for us to get the most use out of this technology, it has to make us better. It, it can't slow us down. It can't complicate, you know, uh, a very high volume, low margin business like ours. Uh, and so I think that 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 flows from a lot of uh, what we just saw on the previous slide about uh, concerns with investment. Uh, but then also, I think it's worth noting that customer experience was was uh, you know very very important as well. This is uh, different ways that customers can use us, whether it's online ordering, uh, whether it's you know some technology like self ordering, um, self checkout, to make things a little bit easier on the customer. Uh, and then uh, number three, I, I would just point out uh, employee experience. That's kind of usability and functionality. Uh, how how hard is this going to be for our our staff to use? So it goes back to what we were talking about before as well. Now, uh, you know, the reason why we asked this and and uh, why we wanted to point this out is we were asking uh, all retailers, okay, well then, of all the things that you can get accomplished in the next 12 months, what are your biggest objectives? And frankly, this one surprised me a little bit and, until I thought about it a little bit more. So kind of this top tier of responses, you know, there's increasing average sales per order, there's growing our online uh, business and improving relationship with customers, using data to maybe personalize some offers. But um, even above those at the top uh, is uh, one in three respondents said, well, we really need to reduce shrink. Um, and just a little bit further down, a quarter of them say, well, we need to reduce our, our out of stocks. And they said that more than uh, you know, just generally lowering operating costs, generally lowering lowering labor costs. And so, 
I thought, okay, that that's kind of interesting. But then the more that I think about it, um, those those options that I just sort of talked about, uh, they really get to profitability. Sure, there are ways to grow top line revenue, but uh, when it comes to things that are uh, you know going to drive efficiency and really drive the bottom line, then it makes sense to me that uh, you know they would rise to the top or near the top. And uh, this slide is one where also I think it's just as interesting to note what is at the bottom of responses and what really didn't rate, uh, uh, as well as what is at the top. And so if you look down there at those three red lines at the bottom, there's very little appetite for uh, operators to streamline, op to, to streamline operations in any of the major departments, whether it's uh, center store or the perimeter. Uh, you know, and, and Chloe, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about this too, because uh, first of all, there are, you know, a couple of things. Can you just give me your thoughts on why these profitability focused, uh, operationally efficient focuses, foci, however you want to say that, uh, why those are ranking as high as driving top line revenue? Um, well, yeah, so I would say, um, I mean, looking just at what's at the top there, I mean, the reduced shrink, uh, you know, reducing out of stocks, I mean, it, that definitely jives, you know, with what we're seeing. We've been seeing nationwide increase in theft and shrink over the past year. Um, you know, retailers like Walgreens are rolling out new store concepts in urban areas, you know, specifically designed to reduce theft. Reduce theft. Um, you know, a company like Target announcing it was going to close nine stores across four states, um, you know, again, due to theft issues, um, not to mention we've, you know, all the intense issues with crime and theft that have been coming out of San Francisco. Um, so, I mean, that definitely tracks um, and in terms of out of stocks, you know, um, to me, that feels like a labor pain, uh, you know, without tech, out of stocks are managed by people. And, you know, the people part has just feels like it's been a never ending challenge since COVID and probably even a little bit before COVID as well. So, um, yes, both of those make sense to me. Yeah, and, and I, I think that this says something too about kind of the, the labor problem as well. Um, you know, in, whether it's in supermarkets or in restaurants, um, whenever whenever the issue of technology comes up, you know, I think a lot of people's ears perk up and they say, well, okay, how much is this? How much of this is a straight labor play, right? How much are you trying to reduce headcount and still? You know, maintain sales with fewer people, but um, at least according to these responses, that doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, the streamlining options were kind of framed to the respondents as um, doing doing more with fewer people, and that just doesn't seem to have much appeal here. Yeah, I, I was just going to say absolutely because I think the opposite is happening from many retailers we talk to. You know, it takes so much right now to find good, reliable workers, and so I'm surmising that for most grocers. You know, it isn't an issue of streamlining, um, but rather curiosity about how they can be using tech, you know, both to make their employees' lives easier um, and therefore keep retention up, um, while then also simultaneously, you know, improving their own bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as we, so as we move on from this slide, we are going to get into the discussion of the top line. Um, here's where we really want to, uh, you know, talk about sales dropping strategies. And so in this table here, um, you'll it'll, it'll look kind of familiar because this is just a different way that we are framing the top objectives for all retailers here. Um, it's just in this table here, so the totals are the same. The next two columns to the right are the cross tabs for how uh, chain retailers responded and how independent retailers responded. And I think it's really important to point out those differences here throughout the rest of the presentation because we really did, I think, find a lot of interesting differences. But I do want to begin with Larry. Um, in large part, uh, chain retailers and independents were pretty much aligned on things like lowering operating costs and reducing labor costs generally, um, and on the need to improve customer relationships. Um, you know, getting data, uh, using it to uh, really convert more direct offers and things like that that go to the top line. But uh, what I wanted to point out now is. Uh, a few places where independents and chains are going to be a little bit different in the way that they respond. And generally, one theme that kind of popped up in these responses is that independents are, for the most part, generally more focused on improving sales within the four walls uh, of their stores. They are, uh, you know, they, some of them have already adopted online sales and 
uh, first party or third party delivery and curbside. But um, compared with chains, they are a little bit more focused on increasing average sales per order, um, growing their prepared food sales and, and sales in other parts of the perimeter, um, and then also on optimizing their assortment, which, which makes sense to me. And that's a way for them uh, to uh, really boost that top line as best they can. And the reason why is that they, uh, all operators, not just independents, uh, do seem to agree that the the in-store departments are, at least right now, more profitable than some of the off-premises channels. Uh, certainly the perimeter departments like the, the meat counter, uh, bakery, deli, uh, in-store food service brands, if you have them, are, are more profitable, it, it uh, appears, than online ordering uh, or curbside pickup. Um, you know, in-store pharmacy does does fairly well, but uh, it's virtually uh, non-existent for independents in this survey. Uh, and then retail media networks we'll talk about later, but we're pretty early on, I think. I think um, most folks are having trouble driving a lot of profit from those uh, departments compared with, you know, the perimeter and center store. So that's why I think that the uh, things we saw on the previous slide are a little bit more relevant. Uh, and of course, what we want to get at with this entire presentation is how uh, those goals and those hurdles drive the current uh, investment landscape and interest in future investments in some technology. So we'll start with some of the uh, in-store technology. And one other kind of big theme that popped up to us and that I think that we can hopefully have Sylvain talk about more during the Q&A is that um, in this industry, it's really software-led right now, uh, more than hardware-led. So uh, if you look at this at this table, the left column of data is where uh, these solutions are already implemented across the industry. So these are the, uh, the number of respondents who have already implemented the, this kind of technology. And you can see uh, software for inventory management and scheduling and, and labor management are already very, very high. Um, and then the big kind of piece of hardware that is more common especially at, at chains, a little less at independence, are self-checkout self kiosks. But right now, uh, this is very, very software-led, uh, much lower levels of adoption for uh, things that we're reading about in supermarket news, you know, things like uh, smart carts and, uh, you know, digital tags and digital signage for end caps or sections, um, the uh, really cool uh, freezer case displays, um, We'll see that they've got you know a good amount of interest, but just low levels of adoption so far. And the way that we uh, look at it next on this slide, so this bar chart is basically a measurement of net interest. We are taking uh, the folks who say that they are not interested in adopting these certain technologies, subtracting them from the folks who are interested. So for all these solutions, among those who have not yet implemented, the ones with the highest interest are still, uh, it's still software related, which is interesting. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that independents are looking to catch up on a lot of these, on a lot of these solutions. Um, chains have already kind of led the adoption. Um, independents recognize that they wanna catch up. And so that's kind of what's driving the net interest for a lot of these. And here we're seeing things like digital price tags and digital, digital signage kind of uh, come up a little bit more. Uh, and, uh, you know, you look way down at the bottom, uh, kitchen robots right now just don't seem very relevant <laughs> to a lot of people, uh, chain and especially independent. Um, and there's a little bit less, uh, runway for things like, uh, you know, self-checkout kiosks because the adoption is so high. And, uh, Chloe, when you, when you look at all this stuff, one thing that kind of jumps out to me is, okay, uh, independents right now are, they're very focused on increasing sales within the four walls. Uh, and yet some of the things that are out there to, uh, you know, maybe drive sales, things like digital signage to merchandise the center store or, or perimeter apartments a little bit better. Um, their interest is a little bit lower than I would have thought, especially relative to chains. Um, and so I'm just sort of wondering what you think about, you know, that imperative to, to grow sales and how it's translating or not into investments they're looking to make. Yeah, Mark, I would say my my overall impression, just, just looking at you know the data we've got here, um, is just that this level of tech is, I would say, maybe just too granular for most independents. Um, 
you know, I would mm. say the data here to suggest, you know, I'm interpreting response from independence to mean there's just kind of higher level issues pulling your focus. Um, and yeah, I would say, you know, options like smart carts um, and freezer, you know, freezer signage, freezer displays kind of feel like add-ons or bonuses maybe at the stage, sort of like a, a nice to have, but not a need to have um, just in terms of, you know, managing the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Well, we've got lots of great questions coming in. Uh, we'll try to get to them as much as we can in the Q&A uh, with Sylvain. We're going to move on right now to the next part here. Uh, so there's the in-store experience, which I think is a, a, a bit of a focus for independence. And now we're going to look at some of the ways that folks are trying to invest in driving online sales. Now, again, here's our, here's our, our chart of top objectives again. Uh, what I'll point out here is that where chains are uh, more focused than independence on some things uh, would be on, for one thing, increasing the online business. Uh, two and five chain retailers said that that's a top objective for the next 12 months. Um, and it also leads into uh, they're a little bit farther ahead than chains on wanting to modernize their technology. We do think that those things kind of go to, together. But overall, uh, we took a look at... Uh, retailers' projections for their online sales growth, we asked them, uh, chains and independents alike, uh, you know, over the next five years, so from now till 2028, what kind of a compound annual growth rate do you think you'll achieve for online sales? Um, the good thing here is that it's, it's, it's largely optimistic. I mean, uh, fewer than one in 10 people are not expecting growth in online sales. And for the most part, I think that people are cautiously optimistic and they're looking for some steady growth uh, in the mid single digit range over, over the next five years. Now there is, uh, there is a difference here, I think, where chains are more focused on the upside case um, and independents might be the ones driving the kind of pessimistic case a little bit more. It makes sense given the, the lead that chains already have uh, in this, but overall, I think it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good distribution uh, that points to some pretty cautious optimism for online sales growth. And with all these sections, we're going to look at kind of how that's driving current adoption and interest in some solutions. So uh, here, I think that it makes sense that of all the e-commerce options, we already have some pretty good adoption of uh, things like direct digital offers. Uh, you know, four and five retailers have already adopted these things. Um, virtually nobody is disinterested in getting that getting that done. I'd like to meet the 2% of people who aren't interested in that. Um, there's uh, much more adoption of first party online ordering than there is uh, third party. And we'll see that the interest is different uh, for those who still yet to implement that. And then uh, discussion of loyalty programs uh, and gasoline rewards. That is uh, more driven by, by chains right now than, than independence, but we'll see that they're trying to catch up. And then we'll also talk about uh, retail media networks and, and video, com video commerce uh, live streams. Uh, it's a pretty interesting thing that we'll get to here on the next slide. So uh, it, as, as was the case before with some of the in-store technology, uh, independents are much more interested in, in uh, adopting some of these things, largely because they're trying to catch up relative to chains. I think that they, they see that these are worthy investments to make. They're trying to figure out how to bring them on with new partners. Uh, and so, uh, and, it, and even still off of the highest base of adoption, direct digital marketing uh, has the highest interest. Uh, but really, I think what is, two things are interesting to me here. First, um, third party online ordering. I think that folks are kind of coming around to the idea that a direct owned channel is probably better, um, you know, not only for hanging on to more of your profit by not paying out a commission, you get to keep more of your data. Um, we'll hear later from Sylvain, I think, about uh, places where uh, third-party partners do kind of help with a, a, a first-party plus model for that last mile. Um, but really here, uh, also, retail media networks, there's a kind of parity in terms of interest among independents and chains. They're both interested in, in, in doing more of it off of kind of a, I would say, a fair to middling base of adoption already, about one in three retailers have already done it. Um, but Chloe, I've got to be honest, you know, this was kind of a new one for me, uh, not covering supermarkets as closely as I might restaurants. And um, 
you know, it, it's a very, very cool thing. I, I think that there's a lot of potential there, but I'm wondering how you see it as the industry expert, where we are with all that. Uh, yeah, I think especially with, um, you know, the retail media network pullout was interesting to me. Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to retail media, uh, I mean, it's a fast growing space. The bigger chains are ahead, obviously, but we're also seeing more mid-tier grocers starting to play in the space too. Um, you know, Fresh Market has been doing some really cool things with shoppable live streams. They, they just launched a retail media network in February. Um, hy just launched uh, its retail and media network, Red Media, a few months ago. Over the summer, Kroger announced it was going to be bringing its retail media ad tech fully in-house. Um, so we're just seeing a lot of movement, you know, just generally in the space right now. Um, it just feels like things are moving and shaking in the space. Um, there are big opportunities there. And, you know, I would say the data seems to suggest, you know, obviously chains are, you know, very aware of that, but um, it seems to suggest, you know, independents are are also interested in growing the space further. Yeah, I mean, it is really interesting, but it's it's just such a heavy lift to produce that kind of content, you know, with the production value and you know, in the amount that you need to produce to have to have a have a network that people can kind of come back to and then that you sell against. So, the fact that both chains and independents want to do it, I think is great, you know, but the just the the production needs of that content are going to be really interesting to look at, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so the last thing too uh, will be a discussion of, you know, data more generally. You know, this, these are places where uh, we we wanted to kind of get at this, this question of, okay, so what does artificial intelligence look like um, in the supermarket industry and what are some of the practical uses for it? Because, um, you know, AI is is in the news a lot. Things like you know, generative AI uh, for search and and chat, um, very very cool, very interesting, and going to be pretty disruptive to a lot of industries. And I think that um, in our industries, in in, in supermarkets, um, they'll also be uh, pretty cool. So we're going to get to that. First, we wanted to ask this question that we ask in a lot of our tech surveys. We ask this of uh, restaurant operators. Uh, before we're doing it here in the supermarket industry. And that's kind of setting a baseline of, to what extent do you feel like you're already kind of optimizing the customer data that you can already collect um, and put to use? You know, interestingly enough, at the beginning of this year, we asked this of restaurant operators and, you know, a majority of them expressed that they they weren't very confident that they were, <laughs> you know, they, there were a lot of, you know, probably nots and definitely nots, you know, we're just, we don't know uh, if we're doing as much as we can with it yet. And uh, in the supermarket industry, it is a little bit of, of the reverse. It's about three quarters of respondents said that, you know, um, they're somewhat, at least somewhat confident to very confident that they're optimizing their customer data. I think that makes sense. You know, they they have a lot of sources uh, to, to draw from, uh, things like direct offers in the POS. But it, it, it shouldn't surprise anybody that, again, this split is going to be um, indicative of the chain and independent split. You know, I, th I think that chains probably have, uh, you know, more technology in place to collect more data and also more technology in place to put it to use as well. So this makes sense to me. But um, I think that even among independents, there's uh, a fair amount of confidence that they know what to do with what they know about their customers. And so we took a look at where a lot of the retailers are getting uh, this data from. Uh, it should be it should be no surprise that uh, transaction data from from the POS uh, is a big one. Also, uh, ones that have loyalty programs. Uh, I think a big reason why you run a loyalty program is this, so not just to drive frequency, but to know who these customers are. Uh, and then about half of the respondents also do pretty well on voice of the customer things like. Uh, surveys, uh, listening to social media, uh, and online reviews. But there are, you know, I, I, I want to just point out that there are, you know, some splits here. Again, like I said before, you know, our, our suspicions were confirmed that uh, the chain retailers are a little bit farther ahead right now in putting, uh, putting their loyalty programs to use, um, having sort of more robust ways to get data out of their POS systems. Um, and that also trickles down to, uh, you know, tracking the redemption of direct coupons and offers as well. 
So a lot of a lot of these uh, should should make sense. Prior slides. And so, um, what's interesting here is that uh, the investments and the current adoption already of a lot of analytics programs and, and AI um, are are pretty interesting. I think that this is an industry that uh, I, I would say is among the better, uh, you know, retail industries at sales and labor forecasting. You know, sort of sort of knowing uh, when your busy periods are, uh, how to manage your inventory and labor around that. Um, and also there's, there's more than half of respondents that have already adopted some sort of automated marketing for personalized offers. So, um, there's still plenty of use of direct mail, I'm sure in the, in the industry, but we have done a pretty good job, I think, of digitizing that and delivering it in ways that are more relevant. So through email, through phone, uh, sorts of technologies that everybody uses and uses quite a bit. Now, uh, the other parts of AI are a little bit further down on this table. So uh, there's the, the suggestive, a suggestive upselling capability, whether the platform is, you know, at a self checkout kiosk or um, in a retail in a retail uh, video network or on your online ordering engine. Um, and then there are also chatbots for customer service or for upselling as well. But right now the adoption um, is much lower in those cases than just sort of the you know, kind of straightforward brute force AI that you would get from, you know, your sales or labor forecasting. I think a lot of folks realize that even if you're using something uh, as common as, you know, Microsoft Excel or another kind of database, um, you know, AI is all through that helping you uh, slice and dice your data. Now, net interest uh, is still, I think, uh, people are, are seeing that um, there's a lot of a lot more progress to be made and quick wins to have uh, through software. Uh, so that's why we see a lot of um, interest in sales forecasting and labor forecasting still. Um, automating things like uh, inventory management uh, and automating marketing are still gonna be very popular. You know, and, and one thing that I was um, not too surprised to see once I really thought about it was just the, the, the interaction of, of chatbots, probably not as relevant to a grocery shopper as maybe somebody during a restaurant occasion. Um, and I think that suggestive selling is probably gonna be uh, dependent on adopting these other things like retail, retail uh, video networks and um, you know a more robust online ordering engine. So I would just stay tuned there. The interest is probably there. It makes sense that chains are probably a little bit more ready than independents are for that. So yeah, Chloe, uh, anything, anything else before we kind of move on to the, the next section? No, no, Mark. It's great. Super comprehensive. Okay, great. Because I've I've been waiting to, been waiting to to bring on our esteemed panelist, uh, Sylvain Perrier. So Sylvain and Mercatus were very very great partners to work with here on this survey. They helped us really uh, get our heads around a lot of industry issues, and so uh, we're really happy to bring him on. Uh, Chloe is going to. Uh, drive a lot of the interview here. Chloe, while you and Sylvain are talking, I'm going to look through all of our great questions here from the audience uh, q and I'll hopefully identify a couple that we can get to before our time is up. Uh, but Sylvain, it's great to see you again. Thanks so much for, for joining us. And uh, Chloe, why don't you take it away? Great. Sounds great. Um, I mean, yes, yeah, Sylvain, there's so much. Obviously, we get some of the great questions coming in. Um, but I feel like, yeah, a great place to start is just, um, you know, where do you think the grocery industry sort of is uh, in terms of curve of adopting technology? You know, it looked like from the survey, like uh, we're seeing most operators starting with the software before they get into the fancy hardware. Um, we're also seeing that kind of investment in the, uh, you know, back office functionality before rolling out the customer facing solutions. But yeah, I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, and first of all, it's great being here with, with all of you. And it's a good question. Investments in technology is very much cyclical. A lot of it, uh, I argue, is is tied to the macroeconomic drivers. And, and we are seeing today, if you, you were to compare 08 to 23, there's there are certain elements that are similar. Customers trading down, going from the preferred high-low merchant down to their discount from the discount to potentially food banks, an unfortunate thing to say. I think what contrasts those two time periods 
uh, fundamentally is, is two things. One is labor rates are higher. And the second thing is the widespread adoption of SaaS platforms and a mobile technology. And so I'm not surprised when we see this pivot to investing deeply in software for, for a couple of reasons. One is software is malleable, easy to change. And you can get more out of it, especially in a climate where data is king in trying to break down data silos, get a complete 360 degree view of the customer. Hardware is more problematic and is typically single function. So if you look inside of a store, very rare do you see widespread deployments of kiosks, uh, low usage, high cost, high support maintenance fees, um, and also sometimes troublesome inside of a store if you have uh, low labor penetration, you need someone to kind of manage those, those kiosks and so on. So the numbers that are being presented are, are not a surprise. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's such a great, um Observation, just the nimbleness of software kind of in the era we're in now, it makes total sense. Um, uh, it's kind of pivoting over, I feel like, you know, the operator's outlook, you know, in our data here, you know, when it came to online sales growth over the next five years was, you know, mod moderately optimistic, not too bullish. Um, I'd love to hear your outlook uh, as well as, you know, what you think the industry could do to really accelerate its e-commerce success, um, you know, I'd also like to hear if you have any thoughts on how independents can be doing that. I think that would be very interesting too, since there's obviously the interest here, um, but it seems like uh, the independent side is where we were seeing, uh, you know, more of a barrier to entry, at least according to this data. Yeah, we're still really bullish on the numbers when it comes to e-commerce growth. So we had, we'd announced seven, I believe 7.8, uh, 7.5 for last month. Uh, actually, September numbers, 7.5 billion in terms of overall online sales. We're actually going to be announcing the October numbers soon with Brick Meets Click. And we've seen, again, uh, a, con a considerable growth in online sales, for specifically for e-commerce. I would encourage, you know, th there's this dichotomy and, and, and Mark, the, the numbers are, are presented by Mark, where we're seeing this fight between the, the chains and the independence between customer acquisition and customer retention. And there's various degrees of sophistication to be able to do that. So what we try to counsel our retailers that are using e-commerce is A, own your customer, make sure you retain, have your 1P and 3P strategy very well defined. And, and what I mean by that, having a very well-defined 1P, 3P strategy is you want to own your customer end-to-end. -end. I think there's generally nothing wrong in using a 3P, but make sure that they are integrated in the fulfillment process, that they're not owning the entire customer relationship. And pricing needs to be considered. So how you price in store versus how you price in your 1P and your you price in your 3P needs to be considered because if you're not capturing the customer who's looking for convenience, that at the very least, as opposed to driving them to a competitor, you want to drive, in, drive them into your brick and mortar. I also feel like that's great. Just really simple, actionable items in terms of, you know, how grocers can be thinking about better optimizing this. The same, you know, investing in technology, you know, would have been more affordable, like so many things years ago in a lower interest rate environment. Um, how should, you know, operators prioritize their investments now, uh, you know, especially with independent grocers, you know, indicating they're, they're very budget conscious? Yeah, I, I go back to the data that Mark presented um, shrink is top of mind for everyone right now. In downtown Toronto, the majority of our retailers actually have implemented security or locked up items, and there's a cost associated associated to that. So examining ways of using technology to limit shrink. Also, skew composition, skew rationalization, quite more fundamentally. I don't. I think in some cases I visited. I, you know, I spend my time visiting a lot of stores. I always feel that they're over merchandise. We as consumers always buy the same 1,000 to 1,200 products on an annual basis. So I think there needs there needs to be some some thought process uh, put into that to that realm. I also think that managing labor uh, is extremely critical. Cost of labor is high. Um, either we give 
better tools and applications to the existing workforce to be able to do things much more efficiently or faster, or we put technology into the hands of consumers so they can self-serve. That comes as at, a, at a challenge, putting technology into the hands of consumers, because then you're dealing with high capital costs typically, and also, I'd argue this, potentially an increase in shrink, which is theft. So it's, it's very much a balancing act, and not every retailer is going to have fundamentally the same opportunities or challenge, independent of access to capital. It's going to come down to who you are as a brand, where are you in, in the United States from a geographical perspective, and who are your customers? You know, we have retailers out there that really cater to a younger, more urban crowd versus a more, you know, rural, comfortable middle-aged group of individuals that still still are great and savvy at using technology, but maybe want to have a more high-touch experience versus someone that lives in you know Metro New York. It's 22 years old. So I think it's also understanding that market baseline first and foremost. Sure, sure. So it sounds like this is, you know, largely we should be thinking of this as sort of a B2B tech fix, not necessarily a B2C in the sense of, you know, this isn't it makes more sense to get this tech into the hands of the you know the store employees versus um, you know versus the consumers or the shopper. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I was going to say, what do you make of the you know chain versus independent sort of splits on wanting to drive this need to drive online sales versus wanting to boost average spend per in-store visit, um, and how really should any operator you know approach striking the right balance there? Yeah, so so it's really funny, Mark. Your 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 research was spot on in a question that I asked a crowd of retailers back in the summertime in Cincinnati, and it was it was wild where the chains were more about acquisition and and the smaller independents were were about retention. Um, so that's great. So that's a, a, a solid indication. I think fundamentally, this could be driven by the shift in consumer spending. So going from your preferred local smallish retailer where you're buying your preferred brand, the things that you really enjoy, they're more expensive and maybe you're not buying them as much and you're trading down to a larger chain who has maybe a less expensive private label item and so on, or national brand that's heavily, heavily discounted. So that could be the case. In my conversations with retailers at the independent levels, they understand if they can retain a consumer and convince them to put one more product in the basket, that profit go, that that amount goes straight to the bottom line. And, and I think it's more, it's easier to conceptualize that if you're a small independent operator, you know your customers, versus if you're a large chain and you have a machine that's running that consistently is about customer acquisition. Turning on a dime is very, is very, very difficult uh, in any case. It's not to say that the chains aren't, aren't thinking about this, but I think as a whole, they are geared today to operate in one way. That's great. Great observations. Um, Sylvain, is there anything else that you want to mention or get to or anything else in the data was jumping out to you before we maybe try to jump and answer some a couple of these uh, questions here in the Q&A? No, I think uh, Mark, you did a fantastic job, and, and just this stuff, this this data will will serve the community and the industry really well to make some strategic decisions. Well, thanks, and that's that's in large part to your help too, and 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 uh, Mercatus's help. So thank you for that, Sylvain. Uh, are you ready for some audience Q and A? Let's do it. Okay, great. Yeah. So, so a lot of these, a lot of, a lot of these were really great uh, ones that I would not have thought to to ask myself. And the first one comes from Colin. Um, so Colin says, with the move to go for more tech and more digital, inevitably that means more electrical consumption. And in some markets that really won't be tenable. And so the question from Colin is, do you see corporate ESG initiatives coming into direct conflict with the move to go toward more digital and more online sales? Yeah, it's, it's quite possible. Um, it is a very much, uh, a, I'll give you guys a great example. I mean, our our state authority here is really pushing for uh, EVs and no gasoline operated vehicles by a certain a certain date and time. And and my state and I, Canada in general, we're just really not set up for infrastructure to be able to do that. And there's a bit of a, a of a mad scramble. So you're seeing legislation not catching up with 
decisions or at the consumer level and so on. So I would expect the exact same conflict to occur within corporate America on on some of these initiatives. I, I would even push that further where uh, even now today with the privacy laws that we see in California, CCPA, now we have copycat laws emerging in 11 other states and AI mm -hmm. really, really taking off. I think people are not understanding on conflicts around trademarks, copyrights and PII. And I think we're going to see even more conflicts at that level that will emerge faster than at the uh, hardware level. So that's a great mm -hmm. question by, by Colin. Yeah, yeah, it definitely was. Um, next one comes from uh, Jeff. And Jeff asks, is online growth just cannibalization of in-store mm -hmm. sales? It seems like a margin killing process in a lot of cases. Yeah, this is like, I used to get asked that question like 10 years ago. And I would say 10 years ago, absolutely. Uh, but what I, uh, we saw a phenomenon through the pandemic is the stabilization and the reality of, of the convenience factor of, of e-commerce. And people normally really get hooked to e-commerce after three and a half, four tries. Uh, it, de it depends on the market. But what we see is, yes, it's to a certain extent, it's cannibalization, but the online basket in some cases, 1.5 to 2x larger than in-store. So the retailer benefits not only from the transition, it's a transition to online, but a much larger product set in any case. So they are capturing item sales that normally that consumer would go buy somewhere else. And that's, and that's uh, more items in the basket, not necessarily taking price increases uh, for online? That's right. Okay, because uh, that's that's a really interesting uh, thing from the restaurant world too. Is that the menu prices will go way oh, yeah. up uh, for an online order, and I don't know if do they do that as much in the supermarket industry. Yeah, it's it's it depends on what they've negotiated with their their if they're three P. It depends. So if they're selling at parity with it in store, then the service fees will typically will use to offset the parity. Uh, or the retailer will take it out of margin. In some other cases, they are passing the entire cost on to the consumer. So then the online pricing will be significantly higher than in store. Gotcha. Uh, really good question here from Garrett. Uh, what other types of shrinkage are retailers looking to solve with software other than theft? I know that theft is top of mind, of course, and in, in the public yeah. comments, but um, what else can we do with technology around shrinkage? Yeah, and, and I think it's important to define theft. So theft is not just in store by a unknown third party. I mean, so there's employee theft, and it's the, the, the harsh reality of the industry. And it's theft across the supply chain from the moment it leaves manufacturing to a distribution center, or in the case if it's DSD directly directly to the store. So theft does occur in, in those spaces. Um, shrink is also food wastage. So it could be vegetables. It could also be, uh, you know, when you walk by the deli counter or the bakery section, the bakery section being my favorite section, um, those things have a stale date. And so the more that you produce, and if you can't sell it, then there is, there's become this, rink, uh, this, this risk that it is thrown away after a certain date. So software really at the end of the day can really help, A, understand your production volumes, what you should be, what you should be, manufacturing in store baking or preparing and that's by looking at historical historical trends so great example the sec the second one is also understanding food safety when is it time and so on and then so when you and so that's a great way of defining shrink that's that is and theft being part of shrink mm -hmm. uh, so i've got a, a really great kind of philosophical question here uh, from Sanjay. Uh, so he, he frames it thusly. So based on the costs related to technology adoption for independence, what strategies do you see them employing to compete with chains uh, aside from just catching up with tech? Yeah. Will the old school fundamentals prevail of safe, clean stores that are easy to shop, in stock, customized assortments uh, based on local demographics and local preferences, um, customer service, uh, et cetera. So how, how much does the, you know, operations element uh, 
matter when we're also trying to catch up uh, technology wise right. to chains? Yeah, and that's a great question. So, so there there are fundamentals, right? So, so think of grocery as an operating system, right? So, if you think of it as an operating system, there's some non-negotiables from an operating system perspective. I need a word processor. I need a spreadsheet. I need to save files. I need to print. I need to browse the internet. Well, grocery is the exact same thing. I need a box. I need POS. I need product on the shelves. I need labor and so on. And guess what? I need clean stores. I need to service my customers, right? You, you can't escape the non-negotiables. So let's just say the non-negotiables are cover, covered at that point. Everything else is about differentiation. And so you can take two approach, approaches, a me too approach and hope you can, you can succeed and win or take it take a complete sideways approach. A great example, and Chloe mentioned it at the top of the webinar, and she's gonna keep me honest here, the Fresh Market in their streams, their live stream where they have influencers unpack a, unpack a bag of groceries and make a recipe. That is going like gangbusters for them. Yeah. And none of the large chains do this. And I, I even, like the closest is a few in China that I've seen. So I don't know why, why is Target not doing this with fashion? Why is Walmart not doing this? That's a great example of differentiation. Um, we have a great retailer here that's local, very small, that does e-commerce. It's 1P, it's, but it's fulfilled by a 3P. They personalize handwritten notes in a bag. I'm like, I'm, I'm a big fan. I think that's a great way to do it. It's low tech, low yeah. tech. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds like, you know, uh, that's why people love the Four Seasons so much, right? Personalized yeah. uh, handwritten service in, in the hospitality sector. Absolutely. Like, awesome. um, okay, we have a few minutes for a few more, and they keep coming here, so I'll try to keep up as best I can, everybody. Next one comes from Kevin. Uh, what role do you see optical analytics with smart cameras playing in the uh, highest priority of reducing shrink? So. This is one that we probably, um, when we were designing the survey, we didn't know too much about yet. Um, but uh, what do you see in the in the uh, world of smart cameras and um, you know incorporating uh, video? Yeah, it's I I historically was a big firm believer of consumers just using their camera on their phone to self scan their products, um, and I think that's still a viable option. Low, low adoption rate, but there's there's a third party solution that's in market right now, and I and it, they're called Focal, and I and what I know of that technology, it's a camera that is fixed on a shelf, and then what it does, it snaps pictures, and it can using AI point out dead zones within there's products missing on the shelf. I think that could be further tweak for to T log to is it is was a product stolen? Oh, I think there's some great applications uh, application in, in that sense, and this is one that I'm very very curious on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a really great question here regarding loyalty. So uh, this is from from Gene, and uh, Gene says regarding loyalty, people are accustomed to go to their local store because they, you know, they might know the butcher, they might know the owner and, and trust the quality there. But with e-commerce, how do you maintain this loyalty if all the stores have the, abil the, avail the ability to sell online? To sell online. Uh, and so does this create sort of a race to the bottom where there's no differentiation, we all can sort of offer this online selling, how do you maintain that personal loyalty that you engender sure. in the store. Yeah. Well, so first of all, if if you're only doing marketplace, you're no better than anyone else on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Number two is if you're counting on a third party to deliver for you and you're at least not giving them standards of op operating and you're not tailoring that experience or whatever you're handing off to that third party to deliver, if you're not tweaking that, you're no better than everyone else. That's why we're seeing a, a mass amount of, of retailers that are doing better on a curbside pickup. Where you, and it's their own, in some cases, it's their own labor in store doing the picking and packing. So you're, you're fostering that relationship with the individual that's doing the picking and packing for you. They get to know you personally. They might 
recognize that you've forgotten to order something or they're recommending uh, a different a different product or something new they have in the store to the person carrying those items out to you in the store uh, you get to foster that relationship at the end of the day that gives you the choice as a, as a consumer. If you love the in-store experience, you can go in. If you're under a time crunch, but you still want that high touch personalized experience, you can go and do curbside and, and so on. I will say again, do not as a retailer take the me to approach. You have to think operationally, put on your customer satisfaction hat. What are the little things that you can do that are gonna make a big, big difference? So, so, I mean, can I just say it's the best answer to that question I've ever heard? Oh, thank you. I <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you. The question I've had and asked constantly in this industry since I've started in it, which is, yeah, I love this idea of um, that it's on you. The onus is on you as the operator to not get lazy with your with your e-commerce, with your delivery, that you need to make that just as special as, as if someone was walking through your doors. It's a great answer. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the amount of retailers that don't even measure their KPIs on their on their e-commerce operation and and suddenly they're like, oh, this isn't working for us. Well, I wonder why you're not measuring it. <laughs> that, yeah. it, it it's just mind boggling. <laughs> All right. So I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to try to combine uh, two that just came in because I, I, I find them to be uh, pretty similar. So, Sylvain, um, what AI technologies do you see taking off in the near future? And somebody also asked um, how important things like these digital price tags uh, are going to be. Do you see them becoming uh, more of a requirement for everybody? Um, so I love what Microsoft is doing with OpenAI. I've been specifically playing around what they've done in Power BI and Copilot tied to Office 365. I think AI inside HQ first, people learning how to adapt. And I think you gotta be purposeful and training your employees so they know what the boundaries are and so on and so on and so on and so on. I think that's first. Mm -hmm. I think moving this back into the front in the hands of consumers at a presentation layer, I love what Bird's Eye is doing. I think that generally makes sense. Uh, and your second part of your question, I forget, if you could just quickly repeat it for me. Uh, somebody asked specifically about some of the in-store digital merchandising. So mm, uh, digital yeah. price tags, stuff like that. Yeah. E so ESL tech, for it, it makes sense for large format and where you have mature loyalty, where you understand where you could affect price at a moment's notice to help you increase sales. If you're simply implementing it to save on labor, yeah, there are great, great studies that can prove that, but the ROI has to apply. I think it's ESL plus the other stuff that I just mentioned that generally starts to make sense. We see that quite well here in Toronto with Loblaws that has done it in their superstore at, uh, size, 150,000 square feet. Very difficult to quickly change prices, and it's tied to their optimum program. So I think they've done a really great job. Great. Uh, so everybody, I think that is all the time we have here. Uh we thank you guys so much for staying with us for this full hour, for asking all these great questions. Um, and Sylvain, thank you so much to you and your team for all the help from the design uh, process of this survey all the way through presenting these insights. This was great. Thank you. Thanks, right, thanks everybody. Have a great day.